Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's session. This is the first in our LRD faculty webinar series for spring 2022, and we're focusing on the ACR, ACRL framework for information literacy for higher education. Uh, welcome and thank you for coming. This session is being recorded and will be posted on our YouTube once we uh, recording is processed, which will hopefully be later today, and all registrants will receive the recording. Anyone who is attending the session live today will also receive a certificate of attendance sometime next week. Uh, before we get started, Pete, if I could have the next slide. We just want to make an announcement in case you are unaware, the library has moved. We are no longer in building 39. Building 39, the level B where we were, is going to be remodeled completely. We're taking over the entire floor. Uh, we can't wait to see what the space is going to look like. But for now, we are in building 71, also known as 4250 Connecticut Avenue. We are on two floors. The third floor is where our reference staff offices are. It is also where circulation will be, and we will have have a classroom available at some time this semester to teach classes in person. The sixth floor is where the reference desk and research support will be located and reference this semester will run from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. Monday through Friday. It is also where the student pods will be basically cubicles with computers. Um, we will not have books on site, but books will be available for pickup by request. Um, so again, I wanna thank you for today. We will have time for questions throughout the session. Feel free to put them in the chat and we will also have time for recorded and unrecorded questions at the end. So now I'm going to hand it off to Pete. Pete, take it away. All right. Um, could I get a quick thumbs up that you can hear me? You are good. Good to go, okay. All right, so welcome to our Framework for Information Literacy for Higher Education seven part webinar series. Um, this series is gonna have today's introduction where we, we talk about what this is and some of the background of why it exists. And then there will be a presentation on each of the six core concepts in this framework. Um, to register or just for information, you can use the use your cell phone camera to scan the QR code here um, or whatever QR reader you use, and um, that will take you to the page with information about the series and registration. So today, what I'm going to talk about is um, kind of the background of the problem, um, why, why this information literacy thing exists, uh, what is information literacy. And then what is the ACRL framework and a, a little bit about how we apply it. Um, so in a nutshell, that is what we're going to cover today. So straight away to identifying the problem. Um, some of this is probably going to sound very familiar um, and I'm gonna have a little interaction element in the next slide. So um, keep in mind that I will ask you about how you've um, gone through some of these things with your students. So lots of projects that librarians have done. Uh, the Ariel project was a two year study um, that involved five Illinois universities. Um, they found that a lot of students were unable to correctly read citations um, and figure out what to do when they had a citation. Um, that there was very poor understanding of library catalogs and library systems in general. Um, that students did not use organized search strategies, um, generally stuck with Google and just simple search was all they could do. Um, and they were generally poor at locating and evaluating resources. Um, so this is a whole two year project and some of the core issues they un unpacked were those ones. Um, another big project was called the Citation Project. Uh, and this is a whole series of studies and they've, they've um, put out a number of reports um, about student writing and about student source use and all kinds of things. Um, Major things they found is students don't really understand sources or read them that deeply. It takes a while for them to develop that, um, that students don't know how to analyze sources all that well, uh, that a lot of students at all different levels, um, instead of you know properly citing things, would actually paraphrase, straight up copy from, or patch write uh, from sentences and sources, uh, which led to a lot of inadvertent plagiarism. Um, and that's, you know, I've worked at a number of universities, every single place I've talked to faculty who had students who were inadvertently plagiarizing. Um, another major study, Project for Information Literacy, I believe they've worked with over 50,000 students now, a national study about undergraduate research habits. 
Um, some of their earlier reports showed that over 70% of these students would use Wikipedia as a major source. 84% um, of students struggled getting started, um, didn't know how to pick a topic or how to explore a topic and then go in and start collecting stuff. Um, so they didn't understand how to start research. Um, only about 30% would even talk to the librarians, um, even, even when they got stuck, even when there were uh, advice from professors to go to, go to the libraries. Um, only about 30% actually did. Um, and that students, they didn't just struggle in school. They actually had information struggles in their personal lives when they wanted to find information. So it wasn't just a school problem. Um, and that information overload, you know, there's so much stuff that students didn't know what to do. It was a major, major issue that they found. So one more of these. Really, this is just a, a whole bunch of things that come up all the time. Um, information junk food. There's a lot of information available. A lot of it's junk, you know. Students start believing things when they see it on, on uh, social media, perhaps, um, just like the rest of us, you know. Um, there can be an over-reliance on that really easy access stuff. Um, if, it's, if it's free and quick and it sort of does the job, then that's, that's what they rely on. Um, in, in the modern era, we, we're struggling as an entire society with propaganda, with disinformation campaigns, um, where it's intentional misinformation. And we also um, have technical issues related to information where algorithms are creating what are known as filter bubbles. So that um, after a while, you only get information that's relevant to things that you've looked at before, because there's an algorithm there that's matching new information to things that you've previously clicked on so that you don't actually see what's outside that bubble. So it's, it's a major technical issue. Um, so we've got technical issues, we've got, you know, motivation things, uh, and we've also got sociological and political problems that come into this, this whole equation. So that, that's a lot of stuff. Um, so I wanna pause, pause for some thought and let you ask, um, ask you a question, um, especially those of you who are teaching your students. Um, so I would request that you reply at, using Mentimeter. Um, the link is right here and that's a difficult to type one. Um, so I'm going to actually copy that link address and put it in the chat. And Megan has already done so. You rock, let's go back to that. So the questions are gonna be on the screen there as well. So I'm gonna to switch to that. So what you will see, you know, considering these problematic findings that I just unpacked, um, which of any, if any of them, have you experienced in classes you taught? So I'll give you all a minute to, uh, to respond to that. So I see that somebody wrote that students would go to Google and Wikipedia and nowhere else. Um, what about cultural stuff? <laughs> All of these problems, um, information overload, easy sources, yep. Wikipedia as a source, about.com, mm-hmm. Unintentional quotation paraphrase, right? Undermining context, um, criticality, definitely all these things. Okay. Um, and, and the second question on there is, how do instructors in your field or discipline actually teach students to find and use, I'm going to say better sources, because um, we're talking about problems there. Um, how do they get to better sources? Is that showing you the second question? 
If you're on the website and hit next slide, the next question should pop up. Okay. Yeah, right here, go to slide. The answer here can be they don't. <laughs> That's always an option. <laughs> Hopefully it's not, but. Yeah, these are all sounding really good. Using the library, using pre-built exercises. Uh, it's built into the course. Um, they make certain kinds of products and have to use certain kinds of sources. Um, using a citation management system, sure. Um, and work through the difference in types. Um, verification of information, right? Who owns Yeah, media consolidation and ownership is a big thing in journalism. Case by case. Um, course level, right, specific to assignments. Yeah, learn as you go, definitely. Uh, hand holding sessions, <laughs> that's what librarians do. We hold a lot of hands. Fabulous, I don't know, do we have any fabulous ones? <laughs> Yay, we're fabulous. Follow the footnotes, yes, yeah, so citation tracking, tracing, tracking, same thing, okay. Yeah, so it's kind of built into um, classwork. So it's it's not often um, it's not often in the standards of some disciplines that there are um, big big things about information literacy. Um, so so why this is a thing that we're talking about is because um, librarians really really tightly focus on information literacy. I mean, our expertise is in how information is created and then stored and then retrieved, right? So that's what we do as librarians. We help people get to information um, that, that has been stored by other librarians, um, generally, to put it in a really gross summary there. Um, so information literacy for us, and we talk about this as an industry a lot, is the ability and the knowledge um, to look at information uh, discovery, right? How you search for stuff, information production, how it's created and what that means. Um, to look at information's value, whether it's a societal value or monetary value, all those things. Um, and then how information can and should be used and how it often should not be used, right? So all of those sets, that set of abilities and knowledge, that those things go into what information literacy is. So um, the Association of College and Research Libraries, they would say that an information literate individual can determine you know, how much information they need. Um, they can access information, they can evaluate it and the sources that it comes from, and then they can use the information effectively, ethically, and legally. Um, so the legality is part of the ethics there. So determine the extent of information needed, access it, evaluate it and its sources, use the information effectively and ethically. So information literacy is kind of our industry's response to those problems that, that present when students are trying to use sources and are struggling with it. Um, so what we have as um, Association of College and Research Libraries has generated is this framework for information literacy for higher education. Um, and this framework is a lot of things. Um, okay, I see in the chat that Megan has posted the link to it. Um, thank you, Megan. So this is an industry-wide standards document. Um, there are similar standards in other countries, right? They have their own information literacy standards. Um, there are industry-wide standards for like 
proper composition writing, for example, the composition has standards and frameworks that they use when they're when faculty in those units design um, courses and programs. Um, this is also part of an education reform movement. Um, there are elements of um, critical pedagogy in here, uh, a variety of other things. Um, this is built as a replacement for um, another document that was made in the year 2000 that was focused on competency-based standards. Um, so it's, it's looking more at a bigger picture than that document did. That one was like, students should be able to do this, like to cite sources. This one is looking at uh, creating a framework so that ideas can be implemented in a variety of ways because there were problems with the old competency-based standards in that interpretation wasn't really available in there. So community colleges would struggle with them or you know, graduate programs would work on them differently. So this framework lets them be implemented more flexibly. Um, and it's designed as a set of interconnected core ideas. And that's, that's what we're gonna talk about here in the next part is these core ideas. Right, so each, these core ideas, each of them is, um, there are six of them. They're, they're called frames in here. So the framework has frames um, and they are threshold concepts. Um, and a threshold concept is um, kind of like that doorway that I had in the last slide. Um, once you understand this concept, you have gone through a doorway and you see different things than you did before, right? So understanding something, you've gone through a threshold. Each one has three parts, uh, the central concept itself, like definition, and then a whole set of knowledge practices. Um, and hold on a second, the definition on another screen. So a knowledge practice would be the ways that learners increase their understanding of information literacy concepts. So things that they might do um, as they're learning this, this concept. Uh, dispositions are ways that they address the emotions, the attitudes and the values of that dimension of learning. That's, that's pretty heady, but there's three parts to each of these. So to, to get to this, let me ask you another question. Um, and I don't have a Mentimeter for this one. This is more for chat or if you want to unmute and talk. Um, think about something you wrote for publication. Um, could be a journal article, could be a blog post, could be your dissertation, right? So you followed a specific process as you researched, wrote, revised, and then published or disseminated this information. Um, so think about the effect of the process you followed on how that information should be used. So can you, can you identify anything in the way that you made it that changes what that information is now good for? I am unmuting myself. I'm AD, I'm in the English department. So quick, a quick response to your, to your question is, I started the habit of annotating and putting everything in a document that I still have. Some of them are now called floppy files because I used a floppy disk at the time of writing the decision, nice. right? Yeah. Um, and that habit has stayed with me. I think I'm gonna cling on to that habit until I can no more um, think and write or I have a cognitive um, deficit to do so. So that, I think that that's the most valuable thing I've learned in my research path. Okay. so. Um... That has that has value as you um, write the write the and revise a document, right? Yes, it helps me not only curate what I've read, but also re helps me recap what I've read so far and where I'm going with it. Is there a connection? Mm. Oftentimes, my reading notes don't lead me to make that connection, but if I have everything in one place, it helps me get to that connection. Possibly, write a better conclusion, okay. uh, whether it's a short piece or a longer one. Interesting. Do you think that has an effect on how a reader, um, how a reader would be able to use the source that comes out of that? I think I well, I haven't exactly thought about it, but now that you mention it, you know, that's the idea. Where did I start, and how am I joining the dots, and where does it take me? Um, so pretty okay. much, if that is the thought pattern I have in my head. Uh, I think I'm trying to communicate and transmit that to the reader who's with me, who's, uh, you know, um, reading what I have to say. Okay. Thank you. That's um, 
there's there's some interesting tools for that kind of a process too and it's it's definitely important to convey the message i think part of um, the effect of that is that you have a better time conveying a message clearly to your readers thank you very much um, anybody else think think something about this that they'd be willing to share you can unmute or chat Um, I'm not really understanding your question. Okay. I'm not really understanding your question. So you might want to rephrase it a bit. So, um, think about it this way. When you, when you write a scholarly journal article, there yeah. is a specific process that is, um, that it follows, right? The editing process is very clear for most journals and it's laid out. Um, there, there are definitely effects of that process on what a scholarly journal article becomes, right? Um, so the, the question here is to get you to consider what is the effect of the process on how something should be used. So a scholarly journal follows a process and therefore it should only be used or it, it should not be used in certain contexts because of the process itself. Does that make sense? Sure. Uh, and the same would apply to like a dissertation or a, a academic book, um, a Wikipedia article, right, follows a specific process or no process sometimes. Um, and that has an influence on how information should be used. Well, I think it, I think it's about making sure that you're not taking something out of context or um, if you're trying to make something fit, whatever your theory is. Um, if it's not there, it's not there. Um, of course, there's still a lot of room since language itself, um, language itself has has many possibilities in terms of being able to 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 unpack. Mm -hmm. And I, I would I would suggest that in some ways, um, trying to teach students to do something like this without having them understand how to unpack language um, and how to understand how, um, how meaning is formed. Mm -hmm. It's a bit more difficult, uh, a lot more difficult actually. And in some ways I feel as though um, it's not just something that you just kind of learn at the dissertation level. It actually starts with undergrad. Um, and so for me, that process actually began with reading philosophy, um, <laughs> reading Greek philosophy. And, and <laughs> yeah, you're taking me to a philosophy undergraduate course that I remember as well. Right. And going all in and, you know, all the way up to and through my experiences um, reading um, feminist philosophy, um, as well as reading um, European um, philosophy, um, and actually sitting in mm -hmm. court here and abroad, um, that helped me to understand um, the, the pro uh, that particular process. Um, and in, right, and you know, one of them being actually deconstruction um, and understanding that. But again, look, even if you're using Michel Foucault, um, you know, history of sexuality, um, you know, even in that, even in that sense, you still have to somehow make it connect. And for me, um, I actually find that doing free writing, um, mm -hmm. take a particular passage and be able to pull it apart and be able to do that, begin that process. What is, what exactly is your response to that? Um, and be able to, to do that. You can do it free write, you can do it um, by creating graphs, quite frankly. Right. Creative process too, yeah. And so for me, I think that if we if we're asking students to be able to to do something 
with what they're pulling from um, peer reviewed journal entries or from peer reviewed books. Mm -hmm. If they're looking at an article from um, New York Times, The Nation, um, Wall Street Journal, whatever it is, to be able to put it, keep it within context, mm -hmm. um, to be able to say when you are moving out of it or if you're ex expanding on it, if you are theorizing yourself, of course, that makes it more complicated, more complex, because then that means what is your, you know, what is your president's, what is, um, you know, what are you using to to justify um, the, you know, going from the original author's meaning towards whatever it is that you're theorizing that you are suggesting or right. that you are. And so I think in our eagerness to rush students through writing courses and expecting them to think like philosophers, we are paying a price. Yeah, I think I think there's something in that. I, I do. I think there's a couple core things you mentioned in there that I want to touch on briefly, and there's some stuff in the chat as well. Um, but so you, you talked a little bit about the creation of meaning in there um, and getting a message across somewhere in the middle of that. And it immediately took me to um, Marshall McLuhan and the medium is the message. Right. Um, one of the, the threshold concepts, which I'm going to show in a second, is about the process of creating a document, right? So the medium that it's delivered in, whether it's Wall Street Journal or New York Times or a scholarly article, um, the process itself alters the message. And I think students, as they become more information literate, understand that that process has an influence on how they should use a document when they find it. Well, so that, that's what I'm driving at here a little bit. Um, I don't want to do too much philosophy on it, no. um, but it is definitely... It is difficult it, to do this in a in a computer environment because the students struggle to actually see the different types of sources sometimes. Okay. That's, that's something librarians struggle with all the time. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, quick in the chat, uh, somebody mentioned literature reviews, uh, one of the central forms of research from both hard science and humanities and social science. Um, yeah, literature reviews are definitely uh, a specific type of product that follows a process of creation. Um, and it takes unpacking what a literature review is and how it functions for a student to really understand it. Dissertation process, definitely an extreme process, uh, deep dive. Um, so it can be used by a narrow audience. Yeah, definitely. Um, usually content area experts. That, that's true of many um, monographs, uh, book length works in, in academic work. Yeah, and we got a bunch of similar stuff too. Yeah, tedious lit reviews. <laughs> Lots of comments in here. It's really good. Video and podcast productions. Um, there's actually information literacy in the disciplines, uh, and we'll get we'll get a deeper dive into that as the series progresses. I, I don't want to do too much on it today, um, but I think that's a that's a fantastic question for taking a deep dive into a specific discipline uh, from William Hamp there. Right, so it's for all information. It's not just texts. It's also video, podcasts. Um, how do you use an interview? You know, the creation of a historical interview or something like that. Um, I think it's it's fantastic to dive into that. So let me let me show you an example of one of these frames. Right, so information creation as a process is one of the six frames, and that's what I was driving at here. Um, so the process of creating and dissemination information vary and the resulting products reflect these differences. So a lit review is different from a dissertation. Um, a Wall Street Journal article or a student paper are gonna be really different from each other. So a student or someone who is, is developing as a, someone who understands this threshold concept, one of the knowledge practices they would do is assess the fit between that process and what they need to do with the source. So if you need to explore the really basic understanding of a topic, Wikipedia might be a fine source to use for that. But if you're engaging in an academic discourse on a complex idea, you'd probably be better off with a scholarly journal, right? So they would assess the fit between the process and the need. Um, related to this, the di one of the dispositions under this frame is that somebody who's developed their information literacy would seek out the characteristic of the information product that indicate whether the process 
followed a good path or not, right? So they would understand uh, the signals of what, what identifies something as following a specific process. So these frames are pretty heady. They're up there. They're definitely ph philosophical in nature. And sometimes it's a struggle to apply them in practice. Um, but this whole series is going to look at these frames in depth one at a time so that we can go more in depth on them. Um, this is just kind of giving an idea of what the design of them is like. All right, so let me just tell you the six, the six core concepts. Here we go. Authority um, or expertise is constructed, so it's built uh, over time, and it's contextual. So it, it works in, inside a specific context. So information is judged in part based on its creator's credibility and for the context in which it's applied. So somebody who is fundamentally awesome in a business setting might not make the best politician. That applies to a lot of politicians we've seen in history, right? So, I mean, yes, they're, they're making economic decisions. They might be great at that, but social and cultural decisions, do they have the same expertise? They, just, they should build a team around them that has those various expertises in order to be a more grounded for lots of different contexts, All right? So authority is constructed and contextual. Uh, information creation as a process, we just talked about that some, so I'll move on. Information has value, um, a, a different kinds of value too. So it might have legal value. It might have you know, cultural, social economic value. Um, it might have good information is expensive. I often tell students this. Um, so if you go to Google and all you get is from Google, you're not getting the best stuff because what you see there is usually the free stuff. And you know, free food can be good, but it's not the best food in the world. You go to the Michelin place to get really good stuff. Um, and that has a, and there's interests behind the value of information. So it costs a lot of money to buy a big database of well-built stuff. So that's one of these. Value does not always equal money. That is very good to put in there. Um, and there's different kinds of value as well that information has. Um, definitely a good thing to point out. Um, I don't want to dig into that too deep, but it's, it's true. Yeah, and the frame does touch on that some too, yeah. Yeah, open, open education resources, right. So they've got value in protecting students economically and, right, and they, they still follow a very specific and very clear process if you're talking about OER, publishing of textbooks. Um, and there's different ways to value them, different ways to evaluate them. I think that's all very important, right? And personal narratives can be valuable for sure. Yeah, so you guys are good discussion going on. Um, so the fourth frame here is research as an inquiry process. So each question in the research process builds on a previous question and paves the way for new questions. So this frame goes into how you know people develop a series of questions and go deeper, and it's this iterative dig into what do we know about things. Then we have, this one comes up in a lot of disciplines, um, scholarship as conversation, right? So research matures over time through sustained discourse amongst researchers. Um, I think that one is, comes up a lot in academia. And finally, this one is where librarians work a lot, um, that searching itself is a strategic exploration, that research works best when approached with an open, flexible mind, and when you apply certain kinds of strategies to the process. Um, I, I think of this one as the, the no-brainer for librarians because we're teaching people how to search all the time. Uh, there's a lot of stuff in the chat. I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep moving. So these six frames are, are the ones that we have there. Let me go back one, one slide here. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. Authority is constructed and contextual. Information creation as a process, information has value, research as inquiry, scholarship as conversation, and searching as strategic exploration. So each of these, it's got a, a big definition for them in the framework, a whole set of knowledge practices, and a whole set of dispositions. Um, and one of the things I do love about the framework is that it talks about who has been excluded from a lot of these processes historically. Um, so at UDC, we talk a lot about um, critical theory, talk a lot about who's included in a discourse and not, 
Um, the framework has a lot of space in it for who has not been included in um, historic creation of authority, for example, um, who has been excluded from the process um, accidentally, often by the design of the process, right? So who can publish and who can't historically? That's, that's the big things that come up with as you discuss this framework and think about it. In light of, um, in light of um, um, some universities um, that are considered to be research one and what is research one, I guess that means that you, um, you know, you've got a, you, you've got um, quite the population of scholars, faculty um, who are widely published, um, authorities. Um, how do you even get to that particular position? And sometimes um, it has more to do with who's making the decision, what um, what voices actually matter. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, who is included in the, the conversation and who is not, whether it's scholarship or development of programs, those kind of things. I mean, and, and historically, there's been serious problems in the entire university academy, not necessarily UDC, but in the universities as a setup. The whole, the, the whole scene, the whole publishing scene. Um, it's tricky. <laughs> it's tricky because if the only voices that are considered to be voices of authority are those coming from those same publishing houses that are mm -hmm. connected to universities that have been published, then that means that those who are peer reviewed um, and published, but not published in the hardcore re, um, research one pu um, publication houses because they come from yet another research one university. Mm -hmm. But you've got lots of people, lots of scholars, lots of information that's not um, reaching um, those who need to hear it. And yeah. it's I think there are some students who are aware of it and who have a comeback and say, well, hey, how, why is it that the only people that we see are those who come from um, a singularity in terms of, you know, identity or singularity in terms of perspective? So that's something. Yeah, for sure. Man, I love these comments. This is fun. Um, I think the Megan points out that the the authority is constructed and contextual really strongly points out um, some of the issues with the uh, historic application of authority to only certain groups. Yeah, I think that is a, a core and I think a really valuable thing in the entire framework, but it definitely jumps in with that authority. Um, since we're going to be short on time, I'm going to, to move on to the so how do we apply the framework um, as librarians? One of the things that we do is we're, we teach. Um, and I want to say straight up, librarians teach. We are your partners in teaching students. Um, and we're always teaching. If I have a student who comes in and says, I need something, usually there's an opportunity there to say, to teach them something about how to use that or how to find a better source or why does the professor say they need that kind of thing. Um, there's a lot of skills that can be trained in there and we do a lot of skills training. But there's also these core concepts underneath that. And I try to unpack that as much as possible with a student. You know, so just the other day, I had somebody who was at another university um, and was able to access different resources. And they were asking me, why, that, why can't they have it here? So I talk about information has value. There's an entire industry that creates monetary value out of information. So I'm teaching them that frame as I'm answering their question about why we don't have something and why we might want to try to get it in the future. So librarians are always teaching. Um, I, want to, I want to nail that in. Um, another thing that we do is we try to partner with faculty to teach these concepts. Um, we don't want to be in the position of the librarians being the only ones who teach these things, because these are about everybody's information. Um, so we would work with you to say, how do we want to get these concepts into assignments, right? So you already teach a lot of these things, you just maybe haven't put the label on it, or maybe haven't partnered with somebody else to create something that teaches just to touch more on it. That is what partnering with faculty is for librarians um, as we're looking at instruction. Um, especially as we get towards higher level classes, 
it's not always the most effective thing to have a librarian come in and teach a basic concept because you are in depth in your knowledge field and we don't know that field the same way. So what we know is how to connect your field to resources or connect your students toward ideas and resources and something. Um, so I, I definitely wanna link to the library instruction program. I hope you go look at this. Um, and I actually had this link here go to our goals and learning outcomes, right? So when you first go to the LibGuide that's, that's about faculty, it's gonna take you to the top, but take a look at our program um, and think about, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be a library session. We do a lot of those and they're great um, when we come into a class and we show stuff, but you can also just partner with us to design assignments. You can partner with us to design a program sequence for an entire curriculum, um, those kind of things. Um, and that's that's where we're bringing in the theory of the framework, as well as how do you use a database, how do you search the library, how are the books organized, how do you use Google more effectively, all those things. Uh, Jasmine's proposing research for us. <laughs> Would love to know the breakdown of partnership habits between librarians and faculty here at UDC. Um, frequency charts, IJED, yeah. Um, I just started here in August, so. To me, I'm just still trying to understand what what has been done, what's being done, um, and how to plug in. So, I love that. <laughs> Kathy says she has some of that information. So, go Kathy. I work with amazing colleagues. That's part of what makes this work. Um, so that's this is my my introduction here to the framework, um, how we use it. So we're we're covering multiple things when we use the framework. It's not just trying to teach them a philosophy of this of information. It's also applied in practice at the reference desk. When I run into a student who looks like they're struggling on an assignment, uh, when I go to a class, when I talk to faculty, all these times this is underneath for me. It's under the hood. So I'll also add one word that might be helpful, and that is the word logic. I actually took a logic oh, yeah. at UDC when it was still being offered here. Yeah, and logical fallacies everywhere, right? Yeah, and so I think that um, I think that if you know, even in that effort to um, to unpack a particular passage or even a sentence, or even to to unpack a word, mm -hmm. you know, to be able to look at. Um, to look at meaning. Now, if you're inventing or creating meaning, you need to acknowledge that and acknowledge how you came to that, how you came to that particular process. Mm -hmm. That itself may take you anywhere from a paragraph to an entire book, just on a single word. But again, logic and mm -hmm. log logical fallacies. Yes. And so... I mean, not even the layer of documents, which I was talking about the process of creating a document. Right. You're talking about the process of creating a logical flow from a premise to a conclusion with a warrant in the middle, right? Awesome. The philosophy of that, that, that is essential for students to get to, yeah. yeah. And so, you know, the thing is, is that we can, we, can, we can do all we like in trying to get students to not rely on these unreliable sources. Mm -hmm to get them to understand how those unreliable sources are unreliable. Yes. Not Does that claim actually follow from what was stated in the source? No, yep. it's simply saying that one source is better than the other because it can't, you know, because it- Because it came from a .edu instead of a .com. That's often as, as simple as they'll do. Right, and so that needs to be, that, that needs to, uh, you know, that, that needs to be covered. And so, um, you know, um, that probably needs to be part of the, the, the process, um, you know, particularly in, in writing courses. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I love that. <clears throat> um, so I'm, I'm wrapping up here. I've, I've got a whole bunch of source resources on this page. Um, obviously, the essential one is to talk to us or to sign up for our webinar series or both. Um, but these other ones are resources. Um, if you registered for this, you should get, you'll get the, the recording, um, a link sent to you as well as I believe the slides, Megan said she was going to send those out. Um, so these, I've put these on the slides so that you can get to them later. Yeah. <clears throat> and then we're going to deep dive into the frames one by one throughout this semester. Um, 
<laughs> so the framework itself, it's a little heady, it's, it's quite nerdy, um, and it's not applied um, in context. So when you first read it, it can be a little confusing. There are some posters from other universities that are that are decent, that are nice, easier way to understand it. And then there's like deep, deep dives into this document. Um, but let me get to wrapping up here. Megan, were you going to talk here? Nope, I was just going to say the feedback form, but uh, you've got that. Okay. Yep. Yeah, so um, we would really, really much appreciate your feedback for, for this session on how it went. Um, there's a QR code as well as a link here. Um, we're also, there'll be time for Q&A, uh, both recorded and then after, if you'd rather talk after the recording is off. Um, so if you have questions that you'd like to be part of the recording, feel free to ask them now. Um, I know that Megan has sent some, um, some email blasts um, and there is of course an announcement on Blackboard. Um, and at the risk of, you know, um, just brain exhaustion. <laughs> I hear you. This is you know one meetings. Um, I, I would like. Um, I, I think I'm going to need this. I'm teaching a. I'm not just teaching a 210 course. Um, I'm also teaching a writing for the web course. Um, and, um, you know digital humanities, um, diversity, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. and, um, and encouraging students to, to begin putting the print out there, um, you know, whether it be for personal, personal professional or, or educational purposes. And so I think I'm going to uh, need y'all's help on that. And so I'd like to, um, arranged to do that. This is a completely online course. I'm thinking maybe um, us doing, um, you know, a Zoom discussion um, yeah. yep. and, and, and whatnot and posting it to make it available for students and, and, um, and open the door for it for their inquiry. Yeah, so I'm going to direct your attention to our schedule now appointments feature on the library site. Yeah, I've um, seen that. I'll do that. Seen that. Yep. Yeah, you can definitely schedule a one-on-one -on -one with us, or if you want a more involved meeting with multiple librarians, uh, send an email and we'll we'll set it up. All right, thank you very much. Most for sure. Great. All uh, right. Does anyone else have any questions that'd like to be recorded? As I wait for those to come in, I do just want to say as a reminder, the recording and the slides to this presentation will be sent to you, and hopefully that will happen later today. It depends on the bandwidth of my internet. And everyone who attended live today will get a certificate of attendance sometime next week, um, probably towards the end because of the holiday weekend. Uh, but thank you for coming today, and we encourage you to attend all of our next sessions. And if you can't make one, that's OK. They are all going to be recorded and on our YouTube available or as long as YouTube exists. So any more questions? Um, could we get, um, you know, for the, um, the slides, could we get a, could we get a, 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 um, a file, you know, yes. for that? Yeah, I will send them as a link and a PDF. Thank you very much, most appreciative. Thanks for coming today. Um, as I always tell students when I wrap up, um, if I don't see you again, and I hope I do, but if I don't, live awesome informed lives and be well.